My name is Monk Rowe for the Phillies Jazz Archive, and boy, am I pleased to have Marty Scheller with me today. Mr. Scheller, welcome uh, and congratulations on your career. Thank you very much, Monk. It's It's been a long and, and fruitful one, and I, I can see behind you at the, uh, the keyboard and music placed in various spots that you're you're still at it. Oh, yes. Can you tell me, I was going to ask this later, but I'm going to go for it now. If, if you're in the mood to write something original or you get a request or a commission for something brand new, is there a way that you get started on that? Yes, it'll be either thinking of what rhythm I want to use and then a bass line that implies some chords and we go from there. I'm smiling because uh, I have to have a bass line myself. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting how um, Starting from scratch, that bass line indicates certain chords or I, it's funny that the melody usually comes a little further down the line. Uh, the rhythm and the bass line come first. Are you sitting in front of the keyboard when you do that? Yes. And I wonder if if you're any anything like me, um, do musical once you get started, do musical ideas to add to it come into your head when you're away from the keyboard? Yes, uh, I have a piece of manuscript paper at the side of my bed <laughs> for those moments where I'll just think. Or usually, it comes from my listening to an album, someone's album that uh, I'm interested in. And somewhere during the course of that, I'll say to myself, gee, that's kind of nice. I think I'd like to write something in that groove. And you have the ability to write down what you're hearing in your head fairly accurately. Fairly accurately, yes. Mm -hmm. When it, that, that's sort of like the uh, the basis. Once I get to the keyboard, uh, I embellish on that, and that's how more um, how different chords and different voicings come into play. Yeah, speaking of voicing, I've been listening to uh, a few cuts of the Marty Scheller ensemble, and I'm wondering what is the minimal or the sweet spot for you as far as number of horn players? That's a rough question. Um, as, as you can tell, my own albums used five horns, two trumpets, trombone, alto sax, and tenor sax. And the reason I chose that is because I can get a small group feeling and a larger group feeling out of the same instrumentation. And there are some spots where um, even people have mentioned, they say, boy, it sounds like a big band. And other spots where I know I want it to be a smaller sound. So I'll have, um, let's say, especially behind the soloist, instead of having all the other horns play behind the soloist, I'll just choose two, let's say, and have them play behind the soloist. That seems like something that takes a while to learn. Um, that not having everybody play all the time is a, an arranging technique. I, I guess less is more applies. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I never studied arranging formally. I studied I was a trumpet player and uh, the trumpet teachers that I had were very proud of the fact that I became a very good sight reader and I was able to play with good technique. But as far as 
arranging was concerned, that was a matter of my good luck and being involved with some very good musicians and also using my ear to determine what kind of things I wanted to write. Plus, I was very lucky in the early stages. I was doing a lot of writing for um, a company called Fania Records, which was like the Latin Motown. And the vast majority of those arrangements were being recorded. And as a result, I could listen to the recordings and I learned certain things did not sound as good as I thought that they were going to. And there were others that sounded a little better than I thought they were going to. And be between those things, and also um, whenever I was at a, uh, either at a gig or a recording session, everybody, everyone warms up. And when the piano player would warm up and I would hear him play something, that I really liked, but that I wasn't able to duplicate, I would go over to him and ask him, what was that that you just played? And get a piece of paper and write out five lines real quick <laughs> and take it home and work on it and work on it. So that became part of my vocabulary as well. Oh, that's a great story. Were you usually in the studio when bands were playing your charts? Yes. Uh, um, with Fania in particular, they wanted the arrangers to be there to, quote, make sure your arrangement sounded good. And by the way, not pay for you being in the studio to conduct. I see. Or get paid for the arrangement, mm -hmm. but uh, not for the conducting. But that was their policy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like it's not our fault if something doesn't Sound right. The way. <laughs> right, right. Did you ever have to run out in, into the main room with a pencil and, and you heard a note that, ah, that's not what I want? Yeah, yeah, that's right. The, the process of, um, back to your original composition, do you ever have eight bars of something that's been sitting around and you're working on something and say, boy, this, uh, it's time for the bridge. Oh yeah, there's this thing sitting over there that I did before. Have you ever pasted things together? Very perceptive, yes, that is the truth. It'll be exactly that situation. I'm usually, I usually don't have things sitting around, but every now and then there are some things that I'll start working on and for some reason not get back to it. I got one right now that's on the keyboard that I got eight bars that I'm not sure exactly where I'm going to go with it. And it's been sitting there for a while. And there's a perfect example of somewhere down the line, I might look at that again at a certain spot that, that I am uh, in another arrangement and look at it and say, gee, that would kind of fit there. So I would alter the key to make sure that it was in the right key. But yes, that happens occasionally. For me, the the hardest part is usually coming up with a form and a chord sequence that's not the 12 bar blues or something. And mm -hmm. I wonder if you, how do you go about finding an interesting and worthwhile set of changes? Well, most of the time I do write in either 16 bar phrases or for Latin music, it can be, you know, four bar phrases, eight bar phrases. Um, there have been a few things that I've written that are in um, not the standard four, four, six, eight kind of rhythm. Uh, I generally don't write in those rhythms, but every now and then there's an inspiration. I remember in particular, uh, writing a piece for a uh, great per percussionist, Giovanni Hidalgo, that was in 5-4, but there was a five, it, the melody statement was 5-4, but there was a little interlude that was in 4-4, four, four, and then back to 5-4. Mm -hmm. But generally, um, I'm a 4-4, four, 6-8, four, 12-8 kind of guy. 
How do you charge for arrangements? Is there um, a union scale, uh, a, a sort of a minimum that you're supposed to get? And as you became more well known, could your price for your charts uh, adjust accordingly? Yes, there is a minimum scale. And as time went by and I started getting more recognition, and to be honest, the work, I was doing better work. I was more pleased with what I was doing. It got to a point where now, when someone calls about an arrangement, I'll ask about the instrumentation, get as, you know, get as much information as I can from them, and then determine how, about how long it's going to take me, which by the way, I'm not one of those fast arrangers, it takes me some time. And then I just say, well, my price will be, and that's the way I get to the price. Do, how often do people say, oh boy, that's not uh, what I had in mind? Well, I'll tell you, that has happened in, the, in my earlier stages, I'll tell you the story of what would happen. I would give them a price. They would say exactly that. Well, you know, the record company is only paying X amount and um, they're not gonna go for your price. So my answer was, well, sorry about that. Um, maybe we can work again in the future. And I would say maybe 95% of the time, somewhere down the line, a week later, a few days later or so, I'd get a call and they would say, well, we, we, we found a way to figure it out. We're going to put in a certain amount from our pocket so between that and the record company, we'll give you your price. <laughs> oh, that's good business practice. Yeah, and I also found out that, uh, I, I don't want to mention the names, but there was a record company where um, they were paying a certain price for all arrangements. And um, I felt that it was time for me to get a little more money. And I spoke to the fellow who's the uh, person in charge of that. And I said, well, I'm sorry, I can't do it unless I get that price. And he said to me, okay, I'll give you that price, but don't tell any of the other arrangers. So naturally, you know, among the other arrangers are my friends. So the first thing I did, I got home and I called them up and I said, hey, listen, the next arrangement you have ask for this amount because they gave it to me. You don't have to mention my name, but insist <laughs> insist on that. <laughs> yeah, there has to be camaraderie in, in, uh, in musicians. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The, the, the hard part um, can be titles. When you're writing an original tune, when does the title come along? Good question. I never think of a title before I start to write. Uh, I know certain, certain uh, composers will get an idea uh, about some, I don't know, they'll look out the window and see a beautiful scene and say, that reminds me of the time I went to Acapulco. So I'm gonna write something that would be appropriate for that. I'm the opposite. I write strictly by the notes and the chords and the harmonies. And when I get to the end, I say, now what am I gonna call this? <laughs> but it's the truth, I'm terrible with that. I mean, I can't even remember one time of me. May I wait, you know, one time I might have wanted to write something for my wife and I wrote something that I felt would be appropriate. But other than that, <laughs> Titles are a problem with me. Yes, I know what you're saying. And I remember Bela Fleck, the wonderful banjo player, said that he just kept a list of titles. He'd, he'd see a word that said, well, that could be a song. And next time he needed one, he'd look at the list. There you go. I can understand that. Yeah. What about um, with your own ensemble over the years, have you ever had an occasion where you wanted not to tell the soloist how to play, but give them some direction so that 
their improvisations sort of jived with the nature of the composition? Not that I can remember. It's usually a case, especially with my own recordings, where I have such faith in the musicianship of the players that I'm anxious to hear how they approach it. And uh, just, uh, you know, there's a re the first rehearsal, everybody's just getting notes under their fingers. The second rehearsal, they're starting to get a little more familiar with it. Third rehearsal, they start playing the hell out of it. And uh, that's, how, that's how I look at it. Yeah. And even with, um, with other arrangements for other groups, um, I generally don't, uh, don't give a, a direction of, uh, especially in, you know, for the soloist of what to do. Uh, that's kind of, uh, uh, how shall I say, uh, can't think of the right, the right term, but uh, heretical or to uh, ask them to play it a certain way. Sure. I prefer that, that they put their own ideas toward it. That's true. That's In fact, that's why you chose them in the first place, because you had faith in what they might come yeah. up with, I assume. Yeah. And I was, I was very pleased, by the way, with the CDs of, that I recorded. They were actually recorded all at the same time. And uh, at that point, I really had no, um, no intention of releasing a CD. I just wanted to do some music that I felt proud of and that I could send copies to some friends. And the fellows in the band started telling me, man, it's too good to just leave it there. You ought to put out a CD. So I had two CDs worth of uh, music that I had recorded over the course of maybe a week or two. And I said, well, it's hard to pick what I'm gonna put on the CD. So I'll just go with different rhythmic grooves and have a variety. And that's how I chose the songs for the first CD. And then 10 years later, everybody, the guys got on me again, they say, you know, you've got all these other songs. Don't let them lay there. So that became the second CD. <laughs> There's one tune, um, Time Will Tell. And, yeah. and you got two grooves in one song for that one. I really enjoyed that one. Uh -huh. Yeah, it had that sort of 12-8 part. And then there's this, I have this own um, sort of barometer about tunes and if a tune ends and I can't hum something back or some rhythm or some melodic phrase then it doesn't really pass muster for me and when I listened to your some of your original work I said well these things as soon as this thing is over I'm going to be able to hum this part back like there's a, a little lick and in, in time will tell it starts on beat three it's like one two ba, 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 da, ba. Uh -huh. it's so hip <laughs> and it just it just like is only one part of the composition so i guess what i'm saying is well done thank you thank you very much yeah i want to take you back a little bit um you grew up in in newark is that correct yes new new jersey do you recall, let's say you were 12, 13, 14, what music made a lasting impression with you? It began with the West Coast Players, a group of friends that I had that um, we used to get together and play were listening to the guys out on the West Coast, Shorty Rogers and Stan Kenton those kind of people. And I thought about that and I realized that the reason probably was it was easier to understand. And um, matter of fact, uh, when I went to high school, one of the uh, fellows in my high school was a very good tenor saxophone player. Um, and uh, he laid a Miles Davis record on me. And it was Blue and Boogie, one of those extended 45s, part one and part two. 
musician's name was Buddy Terry. And he gave it to me. I took it home and I listened to it. And Monk, it went right over my head. I just didn't understand what was going on because I had been listening, like I said, to the West Coast players. So I just put it in with the rest of my music and it sat there for about a year, a year and a half. And when I got into high school, um, I just happened to go through my record collection again and I listened to it and bing, it like hit me, hit me. I, uh, I like sort of said, how could I have fallen asleep on this record? And that led me to try to investigate some of the players that were on it. And I was lucky enough to have gone to uh, a famous old jazz club called the Cafe Bohemia, where the double bill catches this double bill. It was the Art Blakey Quintet and the Max Roach Quintet. Now, my friend and I walked in at the last number of Max Roach's Quintet, which was a beautiful Vols Hot. And that was with Sonny Rollins and Kenny Dorham. And that knocked me out, the idea that they could swing so hard in 3-4. When they got off the stand, Art Blakey came on, and that was the some of the hardest bop ever. That was with Jackie McLean on alto and Bill Hardman on trumpet. And I was so impressed. Oh, and plus, the uh, stage at the Cafe Bohemia was very high, like maybe five, five feet high. And at the end of the set, which was the end of the night, Blakey sat on the edge of the, of the stage with his legs, legs dangling over. And he gave his famous support jazz speech. And I was so impressed. So when I walked outside, I looked up at the marquee and I said, I'm not familiar with these guys. I wrote down the names and that started my collection of the East Coast players. Terrific story. I remember that Cafe Bohemia is mentioned in um, Cannonball Adderley's uh, entrance into the jazz world. Yes. Also. Yes. So then you go up and uh, you end up playing in a band in the Catskills. Right. A Latin so, band. What kind of, sorry again? A, a Latin band. A Latin band. Yes. A very small Latin band. It was just timbales, piano, bass, and trumpet. No conga, no other Latin percussion. <laughs> and uh, a matter of fact, um, the timbale player, everyone, the timbale players were all influenced by Tito Puente. And I heard the timbale player play some of these licks that to me were new. And I thought, this guy is a genius. Listen, listen to these hip things that he's playing. It was actually Tito Puente licks, but that was my introduction to, uh, to Latin music. This seems very interesting to me. Um, this would have been mid sixties. No, 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 earlier than that. Let me okay. see, I'll tell you when. Uh, the summer of 58, I played up in the Catskills, but that was a different, that was a, a little little Jewish hotel with a great band, four of us, four, three guys from Columbia College, my dear friend Bobby Porcelli, a great alto player, uh, my friend Myron Schwartzman, piano player, and um, can't recall the name of the drummer, but uh, that was the summer of 58. The summer of 59 is when that gig that I was talking about uh, came up in the Catskills. I think it was at Young's Gap Hotel. Young's Gap? Yeah. Okay. Well, I've got this vision of uh, 1958 and uh, in the early evening you're, you're playing. Oh, I was uh, 19. Maybe you're 19, you're playing like uh, Night Train or Spanish Eyes, and then you guys go back and listen to Hard Bop. No, actually, that Latin gig, we weren't playing Night Train. 
we were playing the Latin songs, Tito Puente arrangements, but pared down to that small quartet <laughs> group. That's, Next. Was the music, obviously then, that kind of music was popular enough that it got booked into a Catskills uh, club. I guess I'm, this is, this is um, education for me. That, that that Latin music was was um, popular enough for it to be a, a summer band. Oh, absolutely. Matter of fact, all of the larger hotels had big Latin band. Um, Machito's band played a summer in the Concord Hotel. Um, Puente's band played a summer. I can't recall the name of the hotel, but, you know, these were the... Um, the instrumentation was the same instrumentation that they used when they played at the Palladium. But there was a big um, Jewish community that loved Latin music. And they were the people who uh, would uh, vacation in the Catskills. So there would be an American band that would play American music and for the shows. Um, and the Latin band, that was the Latin band. What did you learn in that band and subsequent groups from watching the dancers? Oh, you mean right away I could pick out, I loved watching the dancers. And you can pick out, it. the more I learned about the music, the more I recognized what made a good dancer. And there were some that were obviously really sharp, and that was a pleasure. Uh, I had the pleasure of playing at the Palladium many times, and um, those uh, the dancers were terrific. And it's inspiring to be on the bandstand if you're with a band that's swinging, and the music is, everybody feels it. You know how that is. Even though people don't know what it is, they feel it. They know that something's going on. <laughs> they may not know what it is, but they're aware that something's going on. And the uh, dancers would respond. The best dancers were the ones who were listening to the rhythms and would respond because there's a history of uh, African music where there were just drums and dancers. And that was carried on to Cuba and from Cuba to the United States. And uh, there was some terrific, terrific dance. As a matter of fact, I think it was like Wednesday night at the Palladium was a special night for the dancers. And uh, there are stories about how Marlon Brando used to hang out there. It became like the, the, uh, the hip place to be, you know? <laughs> Was it odd later on when a group like Mango Santa Maria, Tito Puente, if you put that group in town hall, like a sit down concert, did it change the music because there was no room for dancing? Now we're now the audience is sitting and listening. It didn't change the music. But, the, but you could tell if the music was happening by people moving in their seats and occasionally getting up and being told by the ushers, hey, you, you sit down, you can't, you can't do that here. Uh, we played, uh, we did play a gig with Mongo's band in, uh, trying to think of where it was, um, it's a relatively well-known, concert hall and uh, the sound was terrible because they're used to putting one microphone up in front of the orchestra and you know the classical orchestra and they balance themselves and they sound great but in a band where you've got three percussionists that all play loud you got timbali player a conga player and a bongo player who also plays cowbell it doesn't work. So if they would put one microphone for them, naturally someone's gonna get lost in the mix 
Same with the horns. If there's one for the horns, someone's going to get lost in the mix. So those places, although prestigious, were not the best places for to play. Yeah, that's a great way for a brass player to blow their chops trying to oh, yeah. play over the... Oh, yeah. I don't know if there's any such thing as a pianissimo timbale. No. <laughs> no. And you're right about brass players. Um, it was a struggle. Matter of fact, nowadays I see how everybody's got a microphone. You know, those clip-on mics that they have for the horns and all. So you get a good sound man who gets a good sound balance on it. You can hear everything clearly. That's a pleasure. But uh, although I should say that there were some great big band recordings done with, uh, for example, I remember being at one session. I didn't play on it, but I was lucky enough to be there. Uh, Machito's band recorded in a huge hall. It was a dance hall. But in the daytime, they would uh, set up mics. And the way they would do it is the four trumpet players would set up in a circle and put a mic in the middle. The five sax players would set up in a circle, put a mic in the middle. And the producer, who was you know, back in the booth when they would do a, uh, a, a test, uh, would say, um, we need a little more alto sax. That meant moving your seat a little closer. Well, we need a little less, we need a little more third trumpet, a little less first trumpet, so everybody would make that adjustment. But some of those albums sound great to this day. They really sound terrific. So um, technology offers the ability to do a lot of things that couldn't be done, but that's not to say that it's better. That's a memorable statement. I mean, I remember the stories of Louis Armstrong had to move way back to the other end of the recording, where the, the room where they were playing into a, yeah. a megaphone, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there was a famous Latin vocalist named Yayo El Indio, who had one of those voices. And when the singers would uh, overdub the, the chorus parts, they were also in a circle. And Yayo was always told, stand back two steps <laughs> because he just had one of those voices that cut through. You mentioned um, the Miles Davis record that you, you put away for a year and then you got it out again and you you literally had a bing. Yeah. Did, did you have to have a bing with absorbing the Latin rhythms and sort of getting it inside you? In a way, yes. Because uh, that first gig that I mentioned to you, where it was just a quartet playing Tito Puente arrangements, I couldn't understand that very, at the very beginning, in Latin music, the bass player does not play on the one. And that's all the music I ever heard. Bass always played on the one. But on the uh, land music, they play on the one and one, two, three, four, one, two, boom, bing, boom, boom, that kind of rhythm. And I remember playing the first couple of songs and I was really thrown off. I was reading the music, but trying to figure out how come what I was playing was in 4-4, four, four, but that didn't sound like what the bass was playing. As soon as that hooked up, that was a milestone for me, because then I started to appreciate that that was also what the conga player was playing on. And that's what the clave was all about. So slowly but surely, I started finding out those things as a result. I was very lucky, uh, you know, um, Monk, that my introduction to the real deal of Latin music was brought about by two wonderful musicians. One was a Congo player uh, named Frankie Malabe, and one was a timbali player arranger named Louis Ramirez. And Frankie would have me uh, come to his house. He knew that I liked Latin music. I, 
I knew that he liked jazz. So he would come to my house, we would pull out my collection and listen to that. When I went to his house, he lived on Simpson Street, which was, you know, the famous Fort Apache um, precinct. Well, that's it. that was on Simpson Street. He was across the street, about six, seven houses down. And I would go to his house. His father-in-law was a great cook, by the way. He was that rice and beans. They always had it for me. And they knew that I, I appreciated good food. And what Frankie would do is he would set up two chairs facing each other and we would be knee to knee. And he would play music, Latin music, and play on my knees what he would play as a conga player and explain why. With Louis Ramirez, Louis was a great arranger. So play, just by playing in his band and absorbing how he approached the rhythms and what he wrote for the horns, and that, that was my introduction to that end of the music. And like I said, I was always, um, uh, always asking questions to make sure I knew exactly, you know, that I, I was getting the real deal. And I was lucky enough to have had those two fellows um, as my uh, teachers. Yeah, you couldn't pay for that kind of thing in a music school, I don't think. Right, that's right. Wow. Were your parents um, supportive of this uh, solidifying of a career in music? Not at all. Not at all. Uh, I was after high school, I was accepted to Columbia College and they were looking for some kind of profession, preferably a lawyer, something like that. And after my first summer at Columbia, which was the summer of 58, uh, it was like an epiphany. I said, boy, this is what I've got to do. And when they heard that, they were not very pleased at all. Uh, it took uh, quite a while before they started to realize that looks like uh, he, he can make some money <laughs> doing this. Because uh, I have a vivid recollection of one night at the uh, Village Gate, which was a place that used to have Latin music and jazz music uh, for uh, on a six day a week uh, gig. And uh, I was lucky enough, to, I was playing with Mongo's band at the time. It would be Mongo, the show would be Mongo's band and Thelonious Monk's quartet or Mongo's band and the Horace Silver Quintet. And the um, sound man and the light man, who was the same guy, really liked the band and really got to know the music. And there was one song in particular that ended abruptly and um, I, oh, I left out that I had invited my mother and father to come to the show that night. And it was, Mongo was very, very popular in New York. And um, I got them a really, some really good seats. And we played this number that ended abruptly. And as soon as it hit that last pop, the lights went off and it was you know, very theatrical. And the audience went crazy. Uh, applauding, demanding an encore. And the alto player in the band, Bobby Capers, leaned over to me and he said, Marty, isn't that your mom standing on the chair over there? Because she was a shorty. She was like five foot one. And she was up there yelling with everybody else, more, more. <laughs> so at that point, I think they realized that uh, maybe I could do okay in the music business. Uh, I would have preferred not, but that's what I chose. <laughs> thank you for that. That's a terrific story. What was it like to, um, you must have been in the Musicians Union uh, eventually. Yes. And if you're looking for work, you go down to the Musicians Union Hall and like hang? Yes. On one, well, I don't know how it is now, but because I live in Delaware, I'm out of that scene. Mm -hmm. But it used to be uh, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday afternoon, the, uh, the dance hall that was called Roseland 
had a, it was a big dance hall. That's where the musicians would come and you know, look for gigs. And at that time, all the Latin bands had trumpet players. And when you walked in the, the, the uh, entrance, the jazz musicians used to hang out on the left side, the Latin musicians hung out on the right side, and the vast majority of the club date musicians hung out on the main dance floor. And every now and then, someone from the Latin section needed a trumpet player. So the word would filter over to the jazz section where I used to hang out. And I got plenty of gigs that way. Also developed a reputation because I was able to sight read very well and I could solo. So uh, uh, I, like I said, uh, got a lot of gigs that way. What was the average price, the, the average bread that you might make on, I guess we could describe that as a, as a pickup gig. In those days, $25, mm -hmm. $30, something like that. And uh, did you get that money in cash? Yes. Okay. So you didn't have to pay a union fee on that as long as you were paying your dues. Yes. Okay. I wish, as a matter of fact, um, if all of the gigs that I played, including some with Mongo's band um, and all the recordings that I did that I conducted afterward, if all of that went through the union, I would have a pension and a half. But most of them did not go through the union. So, uh, but that's, you know, I was in it for the music and that's what counted. Good statement. So you've been involved in um, a couple really terrific recordings with, with Mungo and I wanted to ask a specific question about the Watermelon Man. And, you know, I've read about how that sort of came about. Okay. But the the terrific thing that the horns did, instead of playing, bah, 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 da, 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 they went, bah. Yeah. How did that occur? Well, I have to take credit for that one. Um, Go right ahead. I, I, I was the one. I don't know whether you read the story Herbie Hancock has told how it got to Mongo. Herbie had recorded Watermelon Man, I think around the summer of um, 92. And um, somewhere down the line, um, Mongo was doing, oh, I remember. Mongo was playing a gig in a little club in the Bronx. And uh, Chick Corea was the pianist, but Chick had already given notice a long time ago that he wasn't gonna be available uh, for that gig. And Mongo was at Symphony Sid's office and um, Donald Byrd was there. And when Donald Byrd heard that Mongo needed a piano player for Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, he said that uh, if you're hung up for a piano player, I know a piano player who's a great piano player. He reads really well. I doubt whether he's ever played in a Latin band, but if you need somebody to sit behind the keyboard and play, there's a guy available. His name is Herbie Hancock. So Herbie played that gig Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And Donald Byrd came to the gig one of those nights. And they were and uh, Donald, Herbie Hancock, and Mongo were talking about the um, influence of Latin and Cuban music on funk music. And Donald Byrd said to Herbie Hancock, play that little vamp to Watermelon Man. So Herbie played Watermelon Man. And Mongo really liked it, told him to come by uh, rehearsal, new rehearsal starting on Monday, which is the first rehearsal that I made with the band. And we played Watermelon Man. Uh, we rehearsed it that week and did a gig on the weekend in a club in Brooklyn. 
and played Watermelon Man and the people were going crazy. And when it came to playing the melody, I thought of somehow the guy who was gonna sing, hey, Watermelon Man, is not gonna be going, hey, it's gonna, you know, he's gonna be a, hey. So he started phrasing it that way. And uh, matter of fact, an interesting story, after it became a hit, Mongo asked Herbie if he had another song similar to that, something, another funk kind of a song. So Herbie said, yeah, and he brought by a song called Cantaloupe Island. And we rehearsed it a couple of times. And then Herbie left the rehearsal and, and Mongo said, nah, I think I'll pass on this one. <laughs> Little did he know. <laughs> So we and never we, got to record that. Yeah. If we did, we would have been the first ones to have recorded it. Yeah, lightning didn't strike twice for, for Mungo on that one. Right, right. Um, I really also, this is pretty minute, I guess, but when you get to the end of, in the last, ba -ba -da -da -da, the horn players, you guys did this wonderful, like, sort of hesitation. Ba -ba -da, and you almost right. feel like, Oh no, the dancers are going to fall down. But, right, but right. you know, of course, one comes back in where it's supposed to. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly how that came about, but I think the three horn players, which were me, uh, Bobby Capers on alto, and Hubert Laws on tenor, just somehow decided, hey, let's do that. <laughs> I can, there's no other explanation I can think of. So your trumpet solo. Is, is so um, perfect for the song. Do you recall thinking, I'm going to keep my bop chops in check, sort of, and um, play these cool riffs because this is what the song requires? Nope. The story is there was a record at that time by Barbara, oh, son of a gun, I can't recall her name. Barbara George. Uh, yeah, that's it. Yeah. And there was a terrific cornet player named Melvin Lasty, who played a trumpet solo on that, that ended with ba ba ba, ba ba ba. So when we got into do the recording of Watermelon Man, we, we approached it like a jazz funk song. So there was a trumpet solo and a tenor solo and a piano solo and the melody out. And the producer said, wait a minute, for airplay, it's got to be like three minutes or so. We got to shorten it. So I want you to cut out the, the, the sax solo, cut out the piano solo. He said, and Marty, don't play any of those snakes. Now, snakes were what he called jazz lines that moved up and down. He said, just play something funky. And right off the tip of my tongue, I said, oh, you mean something like this? And I played Melvin Lasty's ba 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 They said, yes, that's it. Play a solo like that. And that's how that came about. Matter of fact, um, Melvin found out that I hadn't met him at that point, but he found out that I had always given him credit whenever anyone asked about that solo, because it seems as if that solo became popular. And I always gave him credit. And finally, when he, he's from New Orleans, when he finally came to New York, he came up to the apartment right across from the hall where I was, because his friend um, Idris Mohammed, the drummer, was living right across the hall. And Idris said, hey man, Marty Scheller lives right next door. And Melvin wanted to say hello. So we gave each other a big hug. And uh, he told me, he said, man, I appreciate it that you always gave me credit for that. Oh, uh, that makes my heart full, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrific. Were you expected? I remember reading um, that Illinois Jaquette would, would play some of those solos um, and then people wanted to hear the solo as recorded. I hear where you're going. 
You're so, touching a nerve. Yeah. Mongo said the same thing. He said, Marty, that solo, you got to play that solo. I said, Mongo, you mean you want me to play this every time we play Watermelon Man, I got to play the same solo? He said, yes, it's very popular. You got to do it. Boy, that, that, what's the right, can't think of the right term, but that got me nuts. The idea that every time we played it, I had to play that song. And it got a good reaction too. So I understood why he wanted that. But uh, you know how it is from the point of view of somebody who's in, into improvising, uh, the idea of playing a solo exactly in the same way rubbed me the wrong way, but that's the way it was. Wow. So um, let me see if I can vocalize this rhythm. Tell me what, what other Mongo song this is. Bop, 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 bop. Or Sonova. Yeah, I'm thinking of Yeah, Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So right. That that's was, almost a clave rhythm. That's it's exactly the, the Bossa Nova clave rhythm. Okay. That was uh, composed by Pat Patrick and Rogers Grant. I'm not sure. Uh, I think Pat might have written the first part. Do 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 do. Rogers wrote the bridge. It was moving chords going yes. up. Um, but um, that became pretty popular. There was a fellow, Georgie Fame in, in England, who I understand had a pretty nice hit with that song, he a vocal version. With, uh, with lyrics by John Hendricks, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, were you in on the original, you were in the band at that time? Yes. Yeah. There's some really cool uh, horn harmonies is that someone that is that something Patrick wrote out? That's a good question. I'm not sure who did. Either he or Rogers. I'm not sure which one. Some of them are so um they're not experimental. They're just things that you wouldn't go for first. I, I just I'm not even sure how to describe it, but there's this lick near the end. Where the one horn is going, ba -da -da -da, and this other horn's going, ba -da -da -da. yeah, yeah. Like I said, I'm not sure which one of those fellows wrote that. Yeah, well, it sure does stick in your head. I'll, I'll, I'll say that much. Yeah, yeah. When you mention John Hendrix, that brings a story to mind again about Mongo. I had written a song called Cuidado which means be careful. And it was an up-tempo mambo, jazz mambo, written on basically on bebop kind of chords. And uh, Mongo was with Columbia at that time. And um, somehow John Hendrix wrote lyrics to my solo that I played on that. And we were going into the studio to record so Mongo said, hey, John, come to the studio and record that. It sounds great. That'll be a, a great selling point. So he came into the studio, put him in a booth, and boy, did he sound good. It really sounded terrific. So Mongo said, great. We're going to, you know, that'll be on the record. John said, no, no, no. I can do a much better version. That was just a scratch version. Mongo said, no, no, it's, I mean, it's great. And, and John insisted, no, that it's just temporary. So John got um, an advance from Columbia Records, which I'm not sure what it was, but I'm sure it must've been a nice taste. He still had a great reputation at that point and all. <laughs> and John disappeared. He moved to, to Europe <laughs> and we never had an opportunity to do it. And it was always in my mind and Mongo said the same thing that he didn't, it sounded so good what he had written. And you know, the way he was, he was like very particular about doing it right, about using the right syllables and putting lyrics to it. And he did a great job, 
but we never had an opportunity to record it with him. Who knows whatever happened to that tape? The lost John Hendricks. Yeah. Yeah. When you were with uh, Fania Records, did they have, um, I'm, I'm reading a quote here. I think it may have come from your website, but I'm going to read it. It said, the name salsa, literally meaning sauce, has been in use since the late 1960s, popularized by New York's Fania Records as a catchy marketing label. Salsa is often thought of as a Latin essence as the word soul has been a description for black American essence. Very good. Whoever wrote that hit the nail on the head. So combining Latin and soul music, I'm trying to form a question about how deliberate as an arranger you're thinking, here's the Latin, all these Latin grooves, and over here we've got this soul feel, and you're sitting writing a chart. How do you grab that? How do you combine Latin and soul? Well, generally, as I recall, they were two different, two different things. When I wrote a Latin arrangement, I, I was thinking strictly Latin using jazz harmonies in some places to spice it up, but not thinking about soul music. There were some bands like Mongo. There was another fellow named Pucho who also recorded funky kind of things with a Latin rhythm section. And in those cases, yes, that was thinking in a funky, soulful um, kind of way. But um, I, I never, I didn't, it wasn't something that I would combine. Each one was sort of like its own. Um, it was important to do it authentically. I guess uh, Herbie Hancock's Vamp on Watermelon Man is a, a good example of it. Sure, sure, absolutely, absolutely. I'm, I'm uh, fascinated sometimes why 3-2 clave is played instead of a 2-3 clave. Can you enlighten, in, enlighten me? <laughs> okay. Once the song starts, the clave never changes. The phrase changes. I'm going to give you a good example. Let me... I've got a... Here we go. Remember that advertisement for Chiquita Banana and I come to say, okay, you're gonna notice at the end of that phrase, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be clapping the clave. The clave doesn't change, but the phrase changes. Three two. We'll go back. See what I mean? I do. That once the club begins, it never changes. It's the phrase that changes that, that goes along with the clave. Thank you, Marty. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, that's, yeah. Why, that's how I needed it to be explained. Yeah. And by the way, that also, the clave is the basis of how the conga player plays. Because he'll play two or three. Do 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 boom 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 that boom boom is on the one two three do 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 boom boom do 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 boom boom so it all it all hooks up it all hooks up 
I used to be in uh, have a job booking groups for uh, public school performances and one year we had this marvelous Latin band from Albany Alex Torres and the Latin Kings and they had the three percussionists and horns and piano and um, I remember getting I guess aggravated with myself because they would get going and I would lose beat one and I thought I was a pretty educated musician and yeah. I can't find one. That's that's not uh, that's not unusual. That's a common thing for people who are not raised in that culture and are used to hearing it all the time. The same way somebody in a Latin community would listen to a blues and not know where does it start. Well, you know where it starts because you can hear where it starts, but. They're not used to hearing it that way. So that's it's not a, an, an uncommon thing. Like I said, when I first started learning about it, boy, that bass part really threw me off. And now you had the same question, where's the one? Matter of fact, guys have made little jokes about it. Some have written songs, where's the one? <laughs> and you know, when when you get deeper into the rhythms and you get into the Cuban group, there's a group called Muñequitos de Matanzas, which is just a drums and vocal group. That's all, just a bunch of drummers or conga players, maybe uh, someone playing the cowbell. When you hear that, you can get lost easily. Uh, where's the one? When you want to go deeper than that, you get into more African rhythms, where again, you know, you can be surprised, where is the one? How come I lost it? I was following it so carefully. <laughs> well, it's, it's really just a matter of listening and listening. Like I said, the fellow Frankie Malave, who was an inspiration to me, was the one who took me down that road of starting me off listening to Tito Puente and Tito Rodriguez and Machito because he knew that I could understand where the beat was and what was going on. Then we'd go a little bit deeper into the drum and, uh, and voices groups. And after I thought that I had it down, listening to Puente and Machito, all of a sudden I was back to square one. Where's the one? So uh, that's uh, uh, it's a very a very interesting journey to take. Was your work as a arranger and music director subject to the whims of popular music over the years, or was the Latin music community a more level playing field? Well. I would say the Latin and the jazz community. Um, I'm not, it's, it's just not something, the pop music uh, field is not something that I'm particularly interested in. How about I mean, the Miami? There's, a, there's some very good music being recorded that way, but that's not in my heart. Would a group like the Miami Sound Machine um, pass your litmus test as far as Latin music? Latin, yes, they've got their own thing, the Latin music. Um, I'm a little more one of the bands that, uh, I don't know whether it fits in this category, but that I loved was Earth, Wind and Fire and Sly and the Family Stone. But as far as um, that band in Florida, they do play Latin. I mean, it's not completely authentic because there are a lot of pop uh, touches in it, but they are a really good band. I'd like to run a couple names uh, by you, see if you have anything that that you might offer. Um, Lou Soloff. An old friend, a great trumpet player, a really great trumpet player. 
and recorded a couple of things that I had composed. And uh, a good, really good friend. We've known each other. Matter of fact, I met him that uh, second year that I played up in the Catskills. He was in the American band. Yeah, really, really nice guy, kind, kind-hearted fellow, and like I said, a, a hell of a trumpet player. Mm -hmm. He did some great work with uh, Blood, Sweat, and Tears, of course. Oh yeah, and with uh, Gil Evans also. Mm -hmm. And he did a lot of recordings on his own. How about Dave Valentine? Yes, Dave was a, a great, uh, great flutist and with a terrific sense of humor. Uh, it was a pleasure. Uh, we used to meet at recording sessions. And uh, one of the sessions that I mentioned to you uh, where we wrote some music for Giovanni Hidalgo, Dave was the kind of a guy, what they did is they put some tape inside my earphones that I wasn't aware of. And I put them on and I said, you know, I don't hear things too clearly. And everybody cracked up. That's when I knew something had happened and I took off the earphones <laughs> and there was this Dave, Dave Valentini. But a quick, and another, he was another really great musician. It's a shame that he was taken so, so young. I see David Byrne as um, someone listed that you've worked with. That was just a matter of um, horn overdubs. He had already recorded the tracks and he wanted me to write some uh, overdubs on some of them. Mm -hmm. And so he would send you the recording and you- Yeah, he would send me the, the track, everything that was there besides what I was gonna write. How's your relationship been with producers over the years? Pretty good because generally they respect my abilities and they respect my comments and suggestions. So um, I haven't had any problems. Like maybe I just haven't run into the, the wrong kind of people, <laughs> but uh, my, it's pretty good. I think I read something about uh, when Mongo's band got signed to uh, Columbia, that uh, Mitch Miller assigned a producer that um, didn't quite get it. Yes. He assigned a fellow, who, by the way, who is a really terrific musician named Robert Mercy, who wrote for Andy Williams mm -hmm. and other artists. I mean, a really good musician. But to give him the job of producing a Mongo album, we all were like, what? You know, and sure enough, he chose material that was not typically Mongol material and tried to make it into something commercial. And it just, as far as we were concerned, it just didn't work. He did, uh, uh, trying to think of the name of the song, I can't think of it, but um, do 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 In the mood? In the mood cha-cha, yes. Mood cha -cha. So that, that kind of says it all. <laughs> you know, I sometimes use that. It's very curious you say that because when I'm trying to show students what it means to swing eighth notes, I'll use in the mood. And yeah. you know, play it like we know it. And then I'll go, now what if we straighten out the eighth notes? <laughs> but, but, yeah. but, and, and, there you go. And it sounds pretty... I did one arrangement on that album. I did an arrangement of Walk On By on that album. But Bob, Robert Mercy did all the rest. And uh, matter of fact, Mongo, when he signed with them, he said he wanted to do a typical Latin album using different rhythms. Um, and they said, well, no, let Bob Mercy, we want him to do an album. And then we promise that after that, then you can do what you want to do. And 
The second one was an album that Mongo did. I'm trying to think the name of it. I can see the cover, a green cover with a girl's face on it, which was one of the most under the radar records. It's a terrific record, really terrific. But they didn't know how to market at that point. They didn't know how to market uh, that kind of an album. So nothing ever happened. It's a shame because uh, it was really, really terrific album. Uh, back to these Latin rhythms for a moment. I play on occasion for ballroom dancers and they will come up and they'll want a, a cha-cha and then a rumba and et cetera. Am I correct that the exact tempo is really important in playing these rhythms? Yes. How do you memorize? <laughs> well, you know, a cha-cha, when you say rumba, a rumba is actually a very fast number. But in the American market, a rumba was just sort of like a little up-tempo cha-cha. But uh, it's not really a cha-cha. It's, really it's not really a rumba, I should say. Rumba is a uh, almost like a jam session, but a fast, um, fast, fast rhythm. I did an arrangement, or well, maybe that was even too fast. I did an arrangement for Larry Harlow called the Rumbambola that was taken from a piece that um, a famous Latin pianist whose name escapes me now, sorry, uh, had recorded. And uh, I did an arrangement of that and it was really fast, but, uh, but it was a sort of a rumba. Cha-cha was a whole other story. I recall a dance instructor said, uh, you need to play more cha-chas like Billie Jean. What? That's what I said. <laughs> 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 and it was because of the tempo, I think. Right, right, right. That was in, and they, re, they would practice dancing to that song. Yeah. Doing the cha-cha dance. And for them, it, it made perfect sense, I guess. Right. It fit. The rhythm fit. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> By the way, were all these arrangements you've done over the years, did you copy your own parts? At first I did, but I reached a certain point at which it drove me crazy. And I said, once I finish it, the way I do an arrangement is I do the whole arrangement. Then I go back to the very top and go through it again, checking every little thing. After that, I don't want to see those notes for a little while. So, so at this point, I don't uh, do any copying. Matter of fact, I'm still uh, in the dinosaur stage where I don't have finality or you know one of those writing uh, programs. So when I do an arrangement, it costs the people some extra money because they have to have a copy. But like I said so far, um, they'll accept that. Yeah, some things keep working, Marty. Yeah. Yeah, pencil and paper. And do you have trouble finding score paper these days? Yes. Yes. I got. I bought a whole bunch at one point, so I've got some that'll work. But if I have to get some more, I'm going to have to get some that are larger than I would want, but that will at least fit the instrumentation that I need. I see. And do you write your scores in concert pitch or do you transpose them as you go? Transposed, because that's the way I learned. Uh, in the summer, summer of 58, my freshman year, uh, when I worked in the Catskills, uh, my good friend Bobby Porcelli used to write out a lot of the parts and sometimes to make things easier, he would just tell me, well, here's what the trumpet plays, and I would write that out. So from the beginning, I automatically learned to write things out 
in the keys that the players were going to play in. Hmm. So you go to measure four, uh, beat three, and you can look down what you did for the horns on beat three, and there's uh, perhaps three different keys going on. Right. And But you can hear it if it's yeah. right. Yeah. You know, doing it, doing it for that long a time, you get to know what the notes sound like, so that's not a problem. Yeah. Well, I have just enjoyed this conversation so much, and uh, oh, hi. you're a wealth of. Um, I mean, I'm I'm like arranging to me is I don't have the adjective for it, but it's a wonderful occupation, and it's something that I think keeps your brain cells moving. Yes, you're right. I mean, you know, the, the way I look at it is you're faced with a blank piece of paper, and now you've got to put notes, you've got to put things on there that are going to sound nice. So it's a very inventive process. So I, I still, I'm still just as enthused whenever there's another arrangement that comes about, figuring how I'm going to go about it. You know, you know uh, it's a, uh, a joy. It really is a joy. I think, I think it's um, a craft that all the music you've heard in your life can come out in your arrangements. And, and that, there's something about that that makes it worthwhile. Even the bad gigs you played or the Catskills gigs, it, it's still in there and yeah. becomes useful. Well, the way I explain it to someone who asks about, how do you do that? What I tell them is that um, in the course of your life, uh, you're listening all the time. And think of it as learning a language. When you're a kid and you're learning a language, first you got to learn what the letters stand for. And as you develop, you, you as your vocabulary develops, you can speak more clearly and be understood more. Well, it's the same with music. As you learn the uh, sounds that you have that you hear throughout your life, listening, not only just listening to records and music, but just sounds in general, it all becomes part of your musical vocabulary so that after a while you can speak more clearly and easy, it's easier to understand what you're saying. Well said. On that note, I'm gonna uh, thank you again for your time and congratulate you on your career again. You're, you're one of those people sort of on both sides of the, uh, the glass and sometimes the, the real architect behind the sound. So thank you for that. Oh, you're welcome. It's been a pleasure. It really has, Monk.